The cruelty is inconceivable. In February, Lismore, in the heart of New South Wales' northern rivers, was drowned by its worst flood in recorded history. Then, four weeks later, the town copped it again. Another massive torrent of water became its third worst flood ever. While the physical damage from these disasters is enormous, the emotional cost is impossible to count for the thousands of affected townsfolk. Now Lismore's very existence is being questioned. Built on a floodplain, you don't need Nostradamus to predict more water torture is inevitable. So should the town be rebuilt or should its residents run for the hills? This is what brings many people to the Lismore area. Lush, green, rolling hills, and not too far from anywhere, nature at its prettiest. But it's when nature turns extreme that this heavenly place turns hellishly dangerous. As it did on the 28th of February. One of Australia's worst floods smashed the township and the region, leaving five dead, thousands homeless, and the very future of Lismore in doubt. The question now is whether this drowned town should be rebuilt or abandoned for higher ground. Can Lismore actually survive this? I've got no doubt that Lismore can not only survive this, but they can come back better than ever. The first thing you can do is start moving people out of those dangerous areas. So you're talking about moving them out permanently? Oh, yes. It's a terrible dilemma. Leave everything you've worked for, everyone you know, or build again and risk losing it again when the next monster flood hits which is inevitable, according to climate scientist, Professor Will Steffen. We know and we've been predicting and it's been observed that flooding is getting worse and worse. So what surprises me is that we haven't started a well thought out, careful plan to move people out of those most uh, vulnerable flood prone areas. Built on a sprawling flood plain, Lismore is the most flood-prone place in Australia. And on the 28th of February, its community was directly in the path of an unprecedented, colossal 14.4 metre wall of water. A second flood, the town's third biggest in its history, followed just a month later. It's like, why us? It's a hard feeling to describe. It's like, oh well. Let's get into it again, pick ourselves up and keep going. For Mayor Steve Krieg, two months on from the start of the big floods, the scale of the clean-up is crushing. House after house, in street after street, the damage remains devastating. These discarded piles were once people's lives. Now ruined, more than 100,000 tonnes of sodden and rotting rubbish had to be cleared out. And that's before the rebuilding even starts. We've probably got five years of road repairs ahead of us to get back to where we should be. Um, it's just so overwhelming, isn't it? All, it is. all the work and the It the sure logistics. is. It sure is. It's even the futility of it, Steve. I mean, you know, another big flood comes and what happens to all that work? We start again and <laughs> that's the story of, of Lismore at the moment. Rain is what the people of Lismore now dread and fear the most and it's little wonder. 4,000 homes are uninhabitable. Almost every business in Lismore has been wiped out. Every aspect of day-to-day -day life has been disrupted. The scale of the damage is unthinkable. 
The people here don't describe the deluge they suffered a flood. They say it was nothing less than a catastrophe. I don't know if Lismore will continue to exist if floods do become a 14.4 standard um, because that is just too destructive. Pretty much no one has been untouched by this. And Kate Stroud um, has lived through five big floods in her 10 years in Lismore. She considered herself flood aware and her house flood proof. You're pretty high up here, aren't you? Yes. Already. So our flood floor level is 13.3 metres. Which you would have thought would have kept you safe. Definitely. We thought we were safe, yeah. It was certainly the advice Kate got directly from a state emergency services officer in the hours just before the 14.4 metre flood hit. Did you get any advice from that person about evacuating or staying? Yes, he said to us that you will be safe here, given the height of your floor. But the flood hit bigger than predicted and Kate and her partner lost everything in their house and spent six hours in their roof cavity to get out of the freezing neck-high water, waiting for rescue. Kate, what is it like to be in that situation where you are up to your neck in water and you're basically left alone? You've got to make these mm. decisions regarding your very survival on your own. Humans have a basic survival mode that does kick in. We took things like a chainsaw and um, cordless power tools into the roof in the event that we needed to cut through if the water rose beyond the roof level. Most people think about maybe birth certificates, photographs, maybe a computer, money, their wallets. Yeah. And you take a chainsaw. Well, yeah, because none of that matters if you're stuck in a roof full of water. <laughs> Across town, local hardware store owner Chris Waring and his wife were also caught out at 3am. Following advice from the Weather Bureau, the flood wouldn't be any higher than 11.6 metres and wouldn't hit until the next day. And then the noise downstairs woke me up, everything banging together and falling over, and I thought, oh no, it's already in here. And when I got downstairs to have a look how deep it was, it was coming in like I'd never seen it before. And it's just coming up the stairwell. And it was too dangerous to get out at that point? Couldn't go anywhere. You wouldn't get in the water. Um, so we went upstairs, but it just kept coming. It wouldn't stop. That's the realisation of thinking, oh, I'm in danger here. That's really bad. Massive clean-up. Um, when you've got so much mud up here, it's just got in your By now, water. trapped on their second floor in water up to their waists, Chris cut a hole in the ceiling, preparing to climb onto the roof if the water kept rising. That was my last ditch thing, was I was going to get on the roof, but Tara, it's still pouring rain. It was just torrential. Did you make calls for help? Calls for help, SES, um, triple O, um, nothing. So I started ringing my mates, I uh, rang my son, try to, try to get some help. Um, and yet, yes, yes, all I heard was said, well, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna do anything until daylight. And when you're waiting for daylight to come, it takes hours, it takes a long time. Even with daylight, there was no help from an overstretched SES. As the water kept rising, so did the fear. Yeah, I was shitting myself. Yeah. Um, we got on a Facebook, anything we could, and that sort of worked the best. Um, all of a sudden, people started mobilising. And then uh, one of our friends popped up on a jet ski. So. Why does that upset you? Oh, uh, I don't know why it does, it still does. Um, maybe the relief, so I could get my wife out of here. So, I don't know, it still upsets me every time I talk about it, still. Lismore 
had to save itself. And as 4,000 people experienced that day, Kate Stroud was eventually saved by a civilian rescuer. Her knight also appeared on a jet ski. Just remember banging as hard as I could on this window to try and grab his attention. And I remember the moment where his eyes were searching for the sound mm -hmm. and when his eyes locked onto mine and he made this gesture of, I've got you, and then he came over to the window. When you're in those situations, you do just need to dig in and you It's do. out on the street, um, following the path you know, of Kate's escape, before, you get a sense of the volume of water that before, raced through now, here and the incredible bravery um, of the rescuers and their stricken passengers. We actually physically had to duck beneath these power lines um, because of the level of the water. Wow, how terrifying was that? Um, I was definitely in shock, to be honest, but it felt, it felt so surreal. I honestly felt like it was, you know, a, a video game. It just was beyond belief of what you can comprehend with your eyes. It's an experience no one here wants to relive. And the question now is, should they have to? You're right in the, right in the firing line. Everything's falling apart in Lismore at the moment, but um, as you can see from the footage, uh, that's... Through Lismore's February flood, and then when the town was cruelly hit a second time in late March, the Mayor, Steve Krieg, was the relatable, straight-talking public face of the tragedy. How on earth are you coping? What's going on on the ground right now? I'm shitting myself, to be honest with you, Carl. We're at the levee wall for you. Um, I'm about to jump in my car and do the bolt because we're less than half a metre before the levee gets broken and our uh, town gets flooded again. He could speak from the heart because, like so many others here, his heart was broken. I'm probably going to sit down here and have a good ball for a half an hour or so, take it all in. With wife Julianne, Steve has lost his home and two businesses in the CBD. How high did the water get? Uh, so above this ceiling here, and above the roof. This now gutted building was yep, the local clearly. Italian restaurant they ran for 15 years. Now they're starting again. Out of this whole ordeal, what has been the most traumatic for you? Uh, losing our home was probably the most traumatic. Definitely our business, because our business is family owned, family operated, and we have wonderful staff. But losing your home is next level. Uh, and we're with thousands of others that have lost the same, if not more. The boarded up and empty shops of the CBD tell the story. Almost every business is still closed for business. We've got 3,800 registered businesses in the Lismore local government area. 3,100 of those businesses were directly affected by the 28th of February flood. So the repercussions of that, the jobs, the incomes, there's a long flow on effect. Well, that's the lifeline of the town. Are they all going to come back? No, that's the reality of it. Simple answer is no, they won't. Fighting for its survival is the Norco Ice Cream Factory, the oldest business in town and with 240 workers, the town's biggest employer. This is fucked. Absolutely fucked. Sorry guys, we fucking tried. Tried absolutely everything. Well, they'll need to be engineered and, and re-put back into their uh, foundational support. Frustratingly for CEO Michael Hampson, the February floodwaters did a good job of nearly destroying his 127-year-old factory. It certainly won't be operating for the next four to six months. As a ballpark figure, what is the dollar value of the damage done by that flood to your factory? It's very unlikely that we'll be able to get that facility up and running for, for less than probably 50 to $60 million how it was operating before. Is that feasible? 
Pacifica are 100% farmer owned. Um, we, we don't have the facility to be able to raise that kind of capital from our, from our farmers. But we have been very active in terms of discussing our situation with both the state and federal governments. Both levels of government have promised grants to Lismore residents and businesses, but nine out of 10 flood victims are yet to get any money, leaving most in the region in terrible limbo. There's been a lot of announcements, obviously, and with more to come, so they tell me, but it's actually getting the support to the people when they need it the most, which is now. So if you're trying to make a decision as a Lismore resident, do I rebuild or am I going to be offered a land swap deal or, you know, do I just give up and go? How can you make those decisions if there's a void in action? It's very hard. And I, I really feel for those people who don't know whether to rebuild or don't know what their options are down the track. In six months' time, if a land swap deal becomes available and I've just outlaid $50,000 to rebuild their home, well, how's that fair? But respectful of the river town's history and wanting to preserve its community, the mayor's preference is to rebuild. Do you move people or do you move a city because of one devastating event. You've had more than one devastating event and if predictions come to pass, you're going to have many more and you're right in the, right in the firing line. I don't know how to answer that. Um, we, we built on a floodplain and we can deal with floods. I'm fully supportive of rebuilding a much smarter and, and safer city. How does that look? I'm not a scientist but the federal government's announced a, a CSIRO study to look at all the flood mitigation options. So this is what was meant to keep the river away from the township? Yep, so the infamous levee bank. The town's current main flood mitigation tool is this imposing 10 and a half metre levee bank. And on the 28th of February, it had about four metres of water above this. Four metres above this? Above this, yep. It's hard to imagine. It's mind-boggling, to be honest. The predictions are that the floods will become more frequent and even higher. So what do you do? Just keep building this wall up? No, hopefully not. Uh, the idea of building where we are is now to live by a river. And we might have to raise the levee by a metre or so, but there are other options. But one option, obviously, is dredging our river. Tree planting along the riverbanks to slow the water down. Retention basins is something else upriver that we can look at, and those sort of things can drop our river height by maybe two metres. The climate scientist, Will Steffen, says flood mitigation is a piecemeal approach that might work short term, but will ultimately fail. How much dredging do I have to do? How much channeling do I have to do? And I think you might work out that it's uh, a damn sight cheaper to move people out of harm's way than it is to try to, to geoengineer the landscape for a climate that's getting worse. This is a risk game. And in your view, how great is the risk? If I was there, I would not build on a floodplain. Let's put it that way. Will says as devastating as the 14.4 metre flood was here, there is worse to come. And it may arrive sooner than you think. This is a warning, definitely a warning. The intensity and enormity of this summer's flooding in Lismore has left a reeling community devastated and most of us shocked. But eight weeks on, as the rest of us get on with our lives, this is a town divided between those who want to rebuild and those who want to run to higher ground. Proud homeowner Kate Stroud is not just torn. Like so many here, she's stuck. To just realise that the life and the community that you've built here over 10 years is never going to be the same or it's going to be a very long road to recovery, you do question whether you do stay here. Why not move? Why not leave? Well, if you have responsibilities 
in that, you know, you have a mortgage. It's not that simple. You can't just pick yourself up and move. We're completely surrounded by water. Um, Kate, like thousands of Lismore's displaced people, is seeking shelter with friends from a home that is currently unlivable and technically worthless. If somebody offered to buy your property, would you sell right now? I don't think that's realistic. <laughs> I don't think anyone would want to buy it in the shape it's in, to be honest. Um, I don't know where I would go. You know, I've built a life here. To go somewhere else, you restart. But across town, still trying to clean up his hardware store, all Chris Waring knows is he must leave Lismore. I can't, I can't do this again. Um, I've got to move. I can't stay here anymore. And I think that's, that's the story for a lot of businesses. They're so nervous about doing it again. Um, so what it. should happen to the CBD? Well, I think it's just got to move up, up to the higher reaches. I think I don't, and turn it into something else. But I, I just don't think it, it can continue the way it is. Because, uh, as you see, driving into Lismore, this is the plug hole. This is where it all runs to. When you do see the density of building, knowing that this is a floodplain, knowing that the history of this place is to flood, does that give you nightmares? What gives me nightmares is how fast the, the flooding regimes are changing. Uh, As climate know, scientist Will Steffen points out, this is Lismore being drowned by the disastrous 2017 floods. February's 14.4 metre monster was nearly three metres higher. Guess what the people of Lismore want to know today is should they expect that a 14.4 metre flood as ginormous as that is, will be the new norm? Well, it'll, you'll pass through the new norm if we keep emitting greenhouse gases. In other words, there is no norm now because the whole climate system is shifting. The odds of hitting a 14.4 metre or a 15 or 16 metre go up every decade. So consider this a warning. This is a warning, definitely a warning. I know it's difficult, people don't want to move, but I don't think there's any real alternative to keep them safe. Large flow eye with one to take away. With his wife and staff, Mayor Steve Krieg serves the only coffee in a town that has nothing. No bakeries, no ATMs, no clothing stores. Have a happy day. Steve refuses to accept Lismore, his cherished home for 20 years, is in its death throes, but he does concede its survival will require much pain. So you believe that houses that have become uninhabitable, that are currently in the floodplain, should be rebuilt? No, I don't. I think there are areas of Lismore that shouldn't be built on. It's um, all about redesigning your city to make it a more uh, secure place for people to live. But what happens to those people who own those houses? It's obviously a, a, going to be a hard discussion to have, but you can't move forward without making some hard decisions. When we left, it, it was possibly level. Chris Waring has six staff he's trying to find jobs for before he moves out of a town he says is broken. Fearful of the future, but struggling most with his past flood event, Chris recognises it will be a long road to recovery. When it rains, how do you feel? Anxious, very anxious. Can't sleep. None of us can sleep when it rains. When it pours, you can't sleep until it's gone. Yeah, you must feel psychologically pummeled. Mm, I do. Dude, just worn out. I don't have any answers. I don't have any quick fixes. I don't know how I can help them. All I do want to do is cuddle every one of them and tell them it's going to be OK. But I don't... I don't have any answers as far as where to go and what to do. And you don't know if it's going to be OK. And I don't know if it's going to be OK. You're exactly right.
Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9Now app.